good morning, everyone, and welcome. I invite you to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 21. We're continuing our verse-by-verse -verse study through this amazing book. Now, in chapter 20, David and Jonathan learn the very sad truth that King Saul is still determined to kill David. He wants his own son, Jonathan, to be the king, but to have that, he's gonna have to dispose of David. He's not a believer. He doesn't care that God has chosen David. He doesn't even care that his own son, Jonathan, has agreed to let David be the king. He does not. He wants what he wants, and he's gonna use his vast resources as the king to try and locate David, who has fled for his life. So this morning, as chapter 21 unfolds, David has departed his home in Gibeah and headed to the nearby city of Nob. Now, at first, we aren't sure what David wants or what David needs, but what we're going to find is that his dishonesty is disturbing. In a way, perhaps it helps us understand why he has yet to be put in the position of king. He's not ready to be king. He's a liar. And he's got to learn to stop telling lies. Who respects a leader that doesn't tell the truth? Who of us don't expect our leaders to be honest? And so when leaders are dishonest, trust is broken, disrespect begins to mound. And so David's got to learn to be a man of honesty. And that's what we're going to see the work that God is doing within him. He thinks lying is acceptable and to see it as a way to get what he wants. And I really think that's interesting because you think of the courage that he had in defeating Goliath and facing him. And yet here, even though he has faith in Yahweh, he still lacks character and God is working in him. But hopefully this morning that will be very encouraging to you because it's a reminder that God is working in you as well. That he saved you, but he saved you. He loves you too much to leave you like you are. He's going to conform you to the image of Christ. So God's going to expose David's sinful ways. He's going to use these situations to strengthen his faith and establish his character so he'll become the godly leader that God intends for him to become. And we're going to learn that not only from today's passage, but from two of the Psalms that David penned after these incidences that give us further insight into actually what is happening. And we'll look at those as well this morning. So let's begin. You ready? 1 Samuel 21, 1. Then David came to Nob, to Ahimelech, the priest. So we know that Nob is a nearby city to Gibeah. We know that it was known as the city of priests. So as best we can tell, the tabernacle that was destroyed at Shiloh has now been moved to Nob. You have all these priests that are there. The city would have been bustling. So David's going to get to Nob, but he's not going to hang out very quickly because he doesn't want to be located by Saul. But he needs to meet with the chief priest. And we have to understand there are there's a reason why. And that's not going to be evident in his first request, but in his second. So Ahimelech came to meet David trembling. Trembling? Why, why is the chief priest trembling? Well, because that alerts us that something very bad is happening. And he said to him, why are you alone and no one is with you? So first of all, he knows who David is. I mean, David's the national hero. He killed Goliath. Everyone knows who he is. But he also knows that the king wants David, and the priest doesn't want to get in trouble with Saul. Well, why would the king not want to get trouble with Saul? What's going on in the land? Well, we're going to learn in the next chapter just how murderous Saul has become, how much that evil spirit upon him is leading him to do some pretty despicable things. And so we learn in the next chapter that when Saul learns that Ahimelech helped David, he kills him. And he kills the 84 priests that serve with him. And he kills every man, every woman, and every child in Nob all because the priest helped David. So that's how serious, no wonder he went trembling. So we're not aware from the text quite realizing, oh my word, this has really become horrific. Yes, it has. And uh, so that's the scene that we enter into. And so verse two, David said to Ahimelech, 
the priest, the king has charged me with a matter and said to me, let no one know anything of the matter about which I send you and with which I've charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Okay, to be clear, that's a lie. The king has not charged him. The king is trying to kill him. The king hasn't charged him with anything. So David is telling a lie because he's out to get something. But he's going to have to learn lying isn't the way to get what you want to get. And um, remember the first time when David and Jonathan concocted a lie, you know, to tell Father Saul, well, when David's not at the dinner table, well, David's not at the dinner table because he's in Bethlehem. His brother commanded him to come, and so he went. None of that was true. So David's got a pattern of lying, and that isn't good, and it's got to be purged from him, and it will be. So let's just begin by making some points, and there's some simple points this morning. Number one, I want us to identify David's failures. Here it is. The way to get what I need is to tell a lie. Not seek the Lord, tell a lie. That's what David believes, and that's what David is practicing. That's the mindset that has to be changed if he's going to walk with God and become the godly king that he is expected to become. He can't resort to lies and deception. He has to figure out how to tell the truth or don't say anything, but don't lie. Lying is a sin. Lying has to stop. Lying devastates trust. Lying damages your witness and your reputation. Lying is the way of Satan. Jesus revealed that in John 8. When he was speaking of the Pharisees who were not being honest, he said, you are of your father, the devil. He does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Whereas Jesus said of himself, I am the truth. So all of us who follow God, who have entered a relationship with him through Jesus Christ our Lord, are to be people of the truth, and we learn that holiness and righteousness are only expressed expressed through the truth. Ephesians 4, 25, Paul would write, therefore, Each of you must put off falsehood, you can write that down in your notes, and speak truthfully to your neighbor. David's going to have to learn how to do that. So now back to the lie. So what does David want? Verse 3, now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. So holy bread was baked, and it was placed on the showbread uh, table in the tabernacle. There were 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel, and they were called showbread because they were displayed, the idea of a reminder of God's covenant with his chosen people. Only the priests were allowed to eat them, and you may have studied in the last hour what Jesus had to say about the parable. I hope you did. That's a great lesson. And only when the time of display was completed, so when the time of display was done, they would bake new bread. It would be warm. They would put that in. They would remove the other bread, and the priests could then eat that bread. So the priest says, well, I've got five pieces of bread. It's only show bread. And um, and so he informs them of that. But only, listen, only the married priests abstain from relations with their wives until, um, so that they can partake of the bread. Have your young men done that? And so, yes, they've done that. And um, so in verse five, David answered the priest, truly, women have been kept from us as always when I go on an expedition. The vessel that is our bodies of the young men are holy even when it is an ordinary journey. How much more today will their vessels be holy? And so David is just making up this story to try and make it believable to get what he wants and it works. So in verse six, so the priest gave him the holy bread 
for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. So he's just explaining what I just explained to you. So the hot bread would come, the older bread was um, taken away, and it was eaten by the priests. So that's kind of the scenario of the first request that David has made and receiving the bread. Now there's going to be a sidebar in verses seven and eight, and we're gonna be introduced to a man that's gonna have a major part in the next chapter. But today we just get introduced to him, and here's what it says. Now, a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord. Now, I'll remind you that when the Jews referred to the sovereignty of God, they had no trouble saying it it happened by the Lord's hand, and we might feel more comfortable saying, well, it was allowed by the Lord. But they believed whether God purposely did it or he allowed it, he was sovereignly in control of the situation. That is true. That is fair to say. So this man is detained by the Lord, and his name was Doeg. We know that he's an Edomite, and they are the enemies of God's people. And we know that his place was a chief of Saul's herdsmen. And so the Israelites had fought the Edomites. They had defeated them, but it was the pattern that they would take certain men and, uh, and sometimes women and make them servants in their households or somewhere in the kingdom. So evidently Doeg was taken as a young man. He was brought into Israel and he served, which would make him indebted because he might have been killed or imprisoned. So he's very grateful And evidently he was so trustworthy or competent that he's made the chief of Saul's herds. And this man would be extremely loyal to Saul for all this chance that he had been given, which helps us to explain the despicable thing he does in the next chapter. Verse 8, so now back to the storyline. David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear? or a sword at hand, for I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me because the king's business required haste. Well, that's not really true. It wasn't the king's business. It was the fact that the king wanted to kill you, and that's why you left and you didn't have any weapons. Remember, the Philistines mainly control the iron ore, so they control the manufacture of the metal weapons, so there weren't many weapons out, but David, it appears, knows there's a weapon there and he wants it. And so he's going to try and get it, and that really might be the reason why he went to Nob. And so he says, you know, I was in a hurry, I came, I don't have any weapons, is there a weapon here? And the priest, verse nine, said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you struck down in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here. It's wrapped in a cloth, it's behind the ephod, which the priest wore, And if you'll take that, take it, for there is none but that here. And so we do know that after David defeated uh, the giant Goliath, he took his armor and he put it in his own tent. So at some point, he had the sword, as best we can tell, and so it was wrapped, and so some way, how it made the way to the temple, the tabernacle, and to there, the priests overseeing it, David knew it, and now it appears pretty obvious, that's what he wanted. That's what he wanted to get. He wants Goliath's sword. And so you're wondering, why does he want Goliath's sword? Well, he was a younger man when he killed Goliath. Now he's a larger man. He might be able to wield it. He knows that Saul's out to kill him, and he wants some defense for his life, so he wants the sword. And David said, there is none. That is an amazing sword. There is no sword like that. Give it to me. And priest Ahimelech gave it to him. So David got what he thought he wanted and needed, but really he did it by a lie. And so the question is, did that serve him well? Because sometimes you go, I got what I wanted. Yeah, but is that what you needed? Is that really what's best? So let's find out if it is. So verse 10, and David rose and fled that day from Saul. So he leaves Nob, and now he's going to go. But where is David going to go? I mean, the king has spies everywhere in the land of Israel. So where is he going to go? So he's thinking, well, where is the last place that Saul would look for me? Well, I could go to one of the Philistine cities. He wouldn't go to the enemy cities. And really, if I go to Gath, that's the city of Goliath. 
That's the last place he would think I would go because obviously if they find out I'm there, you know, and I don't know what he's thinking, but somehow in his mind, he's going to go to Gath. And so he went to Achish, the king of Gath, and that is the city where Goliath had come from. And you and I are thinking, really? Are you an idiot? You're going to take Goliath's sword and you're going to walk into Gath and think the people aren't going to recognize you or Goliath's sword and remember that you killed thousands of them? Somehow he's not. So let's make the note here, all right? David's failures. The first one is the way to get what I want is to tell a lie. And number two, the way to get what I want is to look to the enemy. I'm going to look to the enemy. I'm going to look to the world, the flesh, the devil. I'm not going to look to God to meet my needs. I'm going to look somewhere else. And that's what he hasn't yet learned. And he's got to learn to look to the Lord for his needs, just like you and I do. We learn when we have a need to go to the Lord, not to go to the world, not to go to the enemy. So the very thing that he lies to get exposes him as the one who killed Goliath. He doesn't blend in. The king's servants recognize David. And you can imagine, if you use your God-given imagination, you know, they're there one day and there's, wait, <laughs> is that not David? Does he, have a, does he have Goliath's sword? And so you can imagine just the, the marvel of that um, lack of discretion. And so he walks in, and the servants had authority to arrest him. And so they bring him before Achish, and they plead their case. Verse 11, and the servants of Achish said to him, is not this David the king of the land? Now, from the text, either Achish didn't, see David on the day of battle, or it could have been, which is real popular, um, probable, he was protected, he was the king. So he couldn't see that far down the hill to see David and Goliath fighting it out. And so he didn't really see him. And so they're saying, isn't this David? And he's like, well, I don't know, I didn't really see him. And, uh, but he's the king, uh, well that's gonna uh, rile him, like wait, he's the king? king of Israel, and then they're going to, well, let me tell you about this song that we heard about that made, made, our, made its way back to our land. Verse 11, did they not sing to one another of him in dances? Saul has struck down his thousands and David his ten thousands, and he's standing right here, O king, this is the man. He's got the sword he needs to be dealt with. And verse 12, and David took these words to heart. The idea he went, uh-oh, what did I just do? What was I thinking? And um, his lying got him from Ahimelech, the thing that he wanted, Goliath's sword, but going to the enemy's camp that didn't make any sense at all. It was likely the last place Saul would look, but the enemies recognized him. And, um, and so it says he was much afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. In other words, Achish held his destiny in his hands. He could imprison him and kill him. And the question was, how was David so deceived? Well, after this, David's going to write a psalm. And the Psalms going to reveal, because the text doesn't really tell us much of, well, what was happening? Like, what were they doing to David during this time? And here's what we read. Psalm 56, a midcam of David when the Philistines seized him at Gath. And here's what he writes. Be gracious to me, O God, for man tramples on me. All day long an attacker oppresses me. So whether that's poetic and uh, not literal or whether it's actual, the idea that they're stomping on him, and I have no trouble believing they would do that. One, because this is really a messianic prophecy of how they mistreated Jesus, but the idea, these men, they were our soldiers. 
Goliath was our champion, and you cut off his head, you killed our brothers, and they're just, can you imagine them, taking it out on David. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. And so this is what they're doing to him. All their thoughts against me are for evil. They stir up strife. So he's now a point of dissension. And notice what he says in verse eight. You have kept count of my tossings. The idea, I'm tossing to and fro. I can't sleep. I'm so upset at what's happening. I'm imprisoned. Put my tears in your bottle. So he's weeping in anguish. So the point is that this wasn't just a few moments with King Akash and what's happening. It looks like it could have been permanent and he could have been executed. So the question is, where is he going to turn? What's he going to do? He's a man after God's heart. He's going to turn to the Lord, isn't he? Not yet. He's still not there. And the truth is, you've looked at yourself or you looked at someone, a fellow believer, and you think, okay, will they finally start looking to the Lord? Will they stop lying? Will they stop deceiving? Will they stop the sinfulness of their path and really turn to the Lord? And sometimes the answer is, not yet. And David isn't ready yet. So verse 13, so he changed his behavior before them and pretended to be insane in their hands and made marks on the doors of the gate and let his spittle run down his beard. What an act, pretending to be insane. Well, now, that happens today, you know, when we have someone who commits a crime and they plead insanity, and the idea is, I was insane. That's why I did that. This is kind of the precursor to that. So he's pleading insanity here, uh, hoping that that will get away. And there might be someone that's legitimately insane when they commit a crime. That's for the courts to decide, justice to determine. But here in this situation, it wasn't true. David wasn't insane. He was fearful. He was faithless. But he wasn't insane but he's acting like he was. Again, he's still resorting to the flesh and his deceptive ways. And um, you wonder what the singers and dancers would say about him now as he's clawing and drooling and acting like he's insane. And, um, but somehow the situation works. And the point is this, and listen closely, it's not that God honors his deception. It's that God is still watching over him and working in him. And the reason that's important is because the likelihood is that you and me today, this morning, we come to this service. In a moment, we're going to have communion. And we come to this place. And when we go to the Lord and admit our sin, it's not like, oh, that's okay. It doesn't matter. It does matter. When God shows you mercy, it's not that it's okay what you did. It's that he's showing mercy and not punishing you as your sins deserve. And so understand mercy and grace are extended to us and we don't get it because we deserve it. You're looking at David and go, he doesn't deserve it. I know, none of us do. That's why it's grace. Grace is receiving and imparting the favor of God that we don't deserve. So we come humbly, we admit our sin, we are prepared to renew our covenant with the Lord and we're gonna find that David is gonna do that. But he hasn't learned his lessons yet. So let me just ask you this, um, what about you? Is there any time that you've ever lied or deceived and learned a painful lesson? Uh, I, I was thinking about when I was about 10 years old, I was going to a school, I was over in uh, Fort Lauderdale, living in Pompano Beach, and I was at, at, went to Nova, and, um, and it was kind of self-paced, and I was sitting in a class, and I mean, here it is, you think of how many decades it is later, I still remember it, and I'm sitting in class, and the teacher says, you see, do you see this quiz? The final is just like it. And, um, and so if you can pass this um, quiz, you're going to ace the final. I heard the, the quiz is the exact same as the final. So I, in my immaturity and deceptive ways, said, oh. So I took the quiz home, and I wrote one, A, two, D, three, C. And I put it on a little paper. I put it in my pocket, and I went to the test. And so I'm sitting in the classroom with the test, and to show you how poorly I was at deceiving, um, I'm actually, I still remember myself, the teacher was there, and I'm just like. 
And I am doing that when the teacher is standing right there over me. And I'm like, caught. Teacher said, took it, took me, humiliating, painful, having to face my parents, having to face the teacher the next time, having to face fellow students, and and maybe today it's cool, but back then there was nothing cool about it. It was a horrifying experience to, to this day. I still feel a measure of the shame that I felt in that incident. And the truth is, I deserved every bit of it. And um, so when David comes to this situation, and he's gonna be shown mercy, as we're gonna read in just a moment, God's not saying, it doesn't matter what you did. God is saying, that needs to stop. And you need to stop lying and deceiving, because I want you to be a godly leader, and godly leaders are not liars and deceivers. That's the truth. So let's keep going in verse 14. Then Achish said to his servants, behold, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to behave as a madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? The idea, get him out. I'm not convinced he's the warrior David. And if so, I don't want him in my presence. So God in his sovereignty frees David, works through an unbelieving authority to free his child, to break his sinful patterns, and to get David where he needs to be. So what did David learn from the incident? That's what we'll finish up with. Go to Psalm 34. So let's read what he wrote, because he has a testimony to write, and it's a hymn of praise to God, and it's a testimony of the lessons that he learned after what he had done and what he experienced. Now, let me say this too. We would like to believe that David never did it again, that David learned his lessons about lying and deceiving, and he would never do that again, except we know the story of Bathsheba. We know what David did to his, her husband, and we know that it took the prophet Nathan to say to him, you're the man. And once again, he was caught in his sin. And I would love to look at my life and say, you know, every time God has taught me, I have learned my lesson and I've never done that sin again. Oh, I wish. But there are times I still do things that I've already been taught that's wrong. And I think most of us can relate to that. So here we find a man and God just keeps, the, the glory of it is that God just keeps working with him. I mean, God has not abandoned him and that's what he's gonna write. Psalm 34 of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech so that he drove him out and he went away. Now to be clear, if you notice the spelling, Abimelech, that's, that was a title that was given to Philistine kings. His personal name was Achish, but he's referred to as Abimelech. Here's what David writes in verse one. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I'm not gonna be a liar. I'm not gonna be deceiving. I'm not making up stories. I'm gonna tell the truth and I'm gonna replace that lying tongue with a tongue that gives praise to God. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and look at that, their faces shall never be ashamed. David should be ashamed for what he did, but that shame would not hinder him as he moved forward. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see, the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge, not in the enemy's camp, but in him. So he learned that, oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him lack no, have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children. Now now watch this, 11 and 12. Listen to me. I'm going to teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life? I didn't want Saul to kill me. Who loves many days that he may see good. I wanted to be the king. 
I wanted to see my wife and kids again. I did what I did, but here's what I learned. If I want to see that, 13, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And that's David's faith. Number one, the way to get what I need is to tell the truth. And number two, the way I need to get what I need is to look to the Lord. That's what David learned. He learned it the hard way through the pain of the consequences of his sin and deception. But he learned to keep his tongue from evil and do good. And we're so grateful as the king that he would really do that as a pattern, a way of life. Verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. That would have been his plight had he not repented. But he finally did. He learned in 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. He learned in verse 18, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. He learned in 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Then we see the inspiration of God's spirit in verse 20. That's a messianic prophecy. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. We know that when the crucified, when time was up, they had suffered too much, or in Jesus' case, the Sabbath was coming. They would break the legs. He could no longer lift himself up. He would suffocate and die. But when the, the soldier stuck the spear in Jesus' side, outflowed blood and water, evidence of his death, so they didn't break his bones like the other two. And so Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. Affliction will slay the wicked and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. But the Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Hallelujah. There's one other lesson from Psalm 56. The mitt cam of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. And here's what he learned. When I'm afraid... I put my trust in you. I'm not putting my trust in my ability to lie, my ability to deceive and act like a madman. I'm gonna put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Thank you for listening, let's pray. And now as we bow before the Lord, it's an opportunity for us to respond to scripture. So how has the Lord spoken to your heart? I hope that when you look at your life, there's a sense of the grace of God working in you where you've learned to put away falsehood and you are known as a person who tells the truth. You are not deceptive. I hope that work has been done in you. But if it's continuing, and this is an issue, this morning is another chance to repent and renew your commitment to tell the truth. The Lord will help you and remind you. And if you're here and you don't know the Lord, pray to him now. Call upon him. The Bible says all have sinned. We're all guilty and we're all in the predicament of needing a savior. Fortunately, God sent one. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Jesus came and died for our sin. He was buried, he was raised. Today, would you turn from your sin and would you turn to Jesus Christ and call upon him and say, Lord, save me. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm gonna be quiet for some moments. The music's gonna play softly and then we're gonna partake of communion. You prepare your heart for these next moments.
invite you to get out the elements now. I trust that you've examined yourself before the Lord and now you are ready to renew your covenant commitment to him. The bread is on the bottom. These are new. So if you peel off the bottom portion, that will reveal the wafer. So if you'll now take the wafer, I'll remind you that it represents the body of Christ because a sacrifice was necessary. He's the Lamb of God. And the scriptures say, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Partake. Next is the juice. And now if you'll just pull back the top layer, you'll see there the juice. It represents the blood of Christ. The scriptures say, in the same way Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Partake. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Praise the name of the Lord. Would you stand with me as we conclude in worship? Let's bow before the Lord. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be honest people. If any among us have picked up bad habits of lying and deception and saying things that are evil, wrong, would you forgive us? Would you cleanse us? And would you empower us to change? and speak words of life and truth, of faith and hope, we pray. After the service, there'll be prayer partners down front. If you wanna talk or pray with someone, if you have a decision to make or a decision to share, we'd love to talk with you. As you depart, men will be at the door with plates and women, and, uh, and they're receiving our benevolent offering. Everything that's given there is used by our deacons to help families in need. So that's there for you. Thank you for worshiping with us today. And thank you, Lord, for meeting with us. Thank you for teaching us, Holy Spirit. Thank you for working in our hearts what is well-pleasing to you. Thank you for not giving up on us, but reminding us that you began a good work. You will complete it. 
we are grateful. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. God bless you, church.